As they sang, the hobbit felt the love of beautiful things, made by hands and by cunning and by magic, moving through him. A fierce and jealous love, the desire of the hearts of the dwarves. Then something tookish woke up inside him, and he wished to go and see the great mountains, and hear the pine trees and the waterfalls, and explore the caves, and wear a sword instead of a walking stick. He looked out the window. The stars were out in a dark sky above the trees. He thought of the jewels of the dwarves, shining in dark caverns. Suddenly in the wood beyond the water, a flame leapt up, probably somebody lighting a wood fire. And he thought of plundering dragons, settling on his quiet hill and kindling it all into flames. He shuddered, and very quickly he was playing Mr. Baggins of Bag End, Underhill, again. He got up trembling. He had less than half a mind to fetch the lamp, and more than half a mind to pretend to, and go and hide behind the beer bellers in the cellar, and not come out again until the dwarves have gone away. Suddenly he found that the music and the singing had stopped, and they were all looking at him with eyes just squinting in the dark. Where are you going? said Thorne, in a tone that seemed to show that he guessed both halves of the hobbit's mind. What about a little light? said Bilbo, apologetically. We like the dark, said the dwarves. Dark for dark business. There are many hours before dawn. Of course, said Bilbo, and sat down in a hurry. He missed the stool and sat in the fender, knocking over the poker and shoving it with a crash. Hush, said Gandalf. Let Thorn speak. And this is how Thorn began. Gandalf, dwarves, and Mr. Baggins, we are met together in the house of our friend and fellow conspirator, this most excellent and audacious hobbit. May the hair on his toes never fall out, and praise to his wine and ale. Let's pause for breath and for a pol uh, polite remark from the hobbit, but the compliments were quite lost on poor Bilbo Baggins, who was wagging his mouth in protest at being called audacious, and worst of all, a fellow conspirator. Though no noise came out, he was just so flamoxled. So Thorin went on. We are met to discuss our plans, our ways, means, policy, and devices. We shall soon, before the break of the day, start on our long journey, a journey from which some of us, or perhaps all of us, except our friend and counselor, the ingenious wizard Gandalf, may never return. It's a solemn moment. Our object is, I take it, well known to us all, to the estimable Mr. Baggins, and perhaps to one or two of the younger dwarves. I think I should be right naming Keely and Feely, for instance. The exact situation at the moment may require a brief explanation. This was Thorin's style. He was an important dwarf. If he had been allowed, he would probably have gone on like this until he was out of breath, without telling anyone there that... The, was not known already. But he was rudely interrupted. Poor Bilbo couldn't bear it any longer. And may never return, he began to feel a shrink coming up inside. And very soon it burst out like the whistle of an engine coming out of a tunnel. All the dwarves sprang up, knocking over the table. Gandalf struck a blue light on the end of his magic staff, and its firework glare the poor little hobbit could see kneeling on the hearth rug, shaking like a jelly that was melting. Then he fell flat on the floor and kept calling out, struck by lightning, struck by lightning, over and over again, and that was all they could get out of him for a long time. So they took him and laid him out of the way of the drawing room sofa with a drink at his elbow, and they went back to their dark business. Excitable little fellow, said Gandalf, as I sat down. It's funny queer fits, but he is one of the best. One of the best. As fierce as a dragon in a pinch. If you've ever seen a dragon in a pinch, you will realize that this was only poetical exaggeration applied to any hobbit. Even to old Took's great-granduncle, Bullroarer, who was just so huge for a hobbit that he could ride a horse. 
he charged the ranks of the goblins of Mount Grom in the Battle of the Greenfields, and knocking their king Gimferbull's head clean off with a wooden club, it sailed a hundred yards through the air and went down a rabbit hole, and in this way the battle was won and the game of golf was invented at the same time. In the meanwhile, however, Bullroarer's gentler descendant was reviving in the drawing room. After a while and a drink, he crept nervously to the door of the parlor. This is what he heard, Gloin speaking, <laughs> or snored or something like that. Will he, do you think, is it all very well for Gandalf to talk about this hobbit being fierce? But one shrieking like that in a moment of excitement would be enough to wake the dragon and all his relatives and kill a lot of us. I think it sounded more like a fright than excitement. In fact, it has not been for the sign on the door. I would have been sure have come to the wrong house. As soon as I clapped my eyes on the little fellow bobber and puffing on the mat, I had my doubts. He looked more like a grocer than a burglar. Then Mr. Baggins turned the handle and went in, but took a side and won. He suddenly felt he would go without bed and breakfast to be thought fierce. As for a little fellow bobbling on the mat, it almost made him really fierce. Many a time afterwards that Baggins part regretted what he did now, and he said to himself, Bilbo, you are a fool. You rocked that right in and put your foot in it. Pardon me said. If I have overheard words that you were saying, I don't pretend to understand what you're talking about or your reference to burglars, but I think I am right in believing, this is what he called being on a stigmally, that you think I am no good. I will show you. I have no signs on my door. It was painted a week ago, and I'm quite sure you have come to the wrong house. As soon as I saw your funny faces on the doorstep, I had my doubts, but treating it as the right one. Tell me what you want done, and I will try it. I will have to walk from here to the east of east and fight the wild wereworms of the last desert. I had a great, 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 great granduncle once. Bull Roarer took and... Yes, yes, but that was a long time ago, said Gloin. I was talking about you, and I assure you there's a mark on this door that the usual one in the trade, or used to be, Burglar wants a good job, plenty of excitement, and reasonable reward. That's how it usually read. You can say expert treasure hunter instead of burglar if you like. Some of them do. It's all the same to us. But Gandalf told us that there was a man of the sort in these parts looking for a job at once. And he had arranged for a meeting here this Wednesday tea time. Of course there was a mark, said Gandalf. I put it there myself for very good reasons. You asked me to find the 14th man for your expedition and I chose Mr. Baggins. Just let anyone say I chose the wrong man at the wrong house, and you can stop at thirteen, and have all the bad luck you like, or go back to digging coal. He scowled so angrily at Gloin that the dwarf huddled back in his chair, and when Bilbo tried to open his mouth to ask a question, he turned and frowned at him and stuck out his bushy elbows, eyebrows, till Bilbo shut his mouth tight with a snap. That's right said Gandalf. Let's have no more argument. I have chosen Mr. Baggins, and that ought to be enough for all of you. If I say he is a burglar, a burglar he is, or will be when the time comes. There is a lot more of him than you guess, and a deal more than he has. Any idea of himself, you may possibly all live to thank me yet. Now, Bilbo, my boy, fetch the lamp, and let's have a light. Light on this. On the table, in the light of the big lamp with the red shade, he spread a piece of parchment rather like mat. This was made by Thra, your grandfather Thor, he said in answer to the dwarves. Excited questions. It is a plain of the mountain. I don't see that this will help us much, said Thorin, disappointingly after a glance. I remember the mountain well enough and the lands about it, and I know where Mirkwood is and the withered heath, and where the great dragons bred. There is a dragon's mark in the red on the mountain, said Butlin, but it will be easy enough to find him without that, even if we arrive there. There is one point that you have noticed, said the wizard, and that is the secret entrance. See that rune on the west side with the hand pointing to it from the other runes? That marks a hidden package. 
to the lower hills. It may have been secret once, said Thorn, but how do we know that it's secret any longer? Old Smog had lived there long enough to find out that there's anything to know about those caves. He may, but he can't be used it for years and years. Why? Because it's too small. Five feet high, door, three may walk abreast, said Zarun, but Smog could not creep in a hole that size. Not even when he is a young dragon, certainly not devouring so many of the dwarves of the men's of Dale. Seemed a great big hole to me, squeaked Bilbo, who had no experience of dragons and only of hobbit holes. He was getting excited and interested again, so that he forgot to keep his mouth shut. He loved maps, and in his hall there hung a large one of the county road with all the favorite walks marked out on red ink. How could such a large door be kept secret from everybody outside apart from the dragon, he said. He was only a little hobbit, you must remember. In a lot of ways, said Gandalf, but in what we see this one had been hidden. We don't know without going to see. From what I say on the map, I should guess there is a closed door which has been made to look exactly like the side of the mountain. That is the usual dwarf's method. I think that is right, isn't it? Quite right, said Thorne. Also, went on Gandalf, I forgot to mention that with the map and went a key. A small and curious key. Here it is. He said, and handed to Thorin a key with a long barrel and intricate wards made of silver. Keep it safe. Indeed I will, said Thorin, as he fastened it upon a fine chain and hung it about his neck and under his jacket. Now things began to look a little more hopeful. This news alters them much for the better. So far we have had clear idea what to do. We thought of going east as quiet and careful as we could and as far as the long lake. After that, the trouble would begin. A long time before that, if I know of anything about the roads east, interrupted Gandalf, we might go from there up along the river running. Went to Thorn, taking no notice, and said the ruins of Dale, the old town in the valley there, under the shadow of the mountain. But none of us liked the idea of the front gate. The river runs right out of it through the great cliff to the south of the mountain, and out of it comes the dragon too far too often unless he has been changed. That would be no good, said the wizard, not without a mighty warrior, even a hero. I tried to find one once, but the warrior busy fighting another one in a distant land and in this neighborhood, heroics are scarce or simply not to be found. Swords in these parts are mostly blunt, and axes are used for trees, and shields as cradles or dish covers. Dragons are comfortably far off, and therefore legendary. This is why I settled on burglary, especially when I remembered the existence of a side door. And here's our little Bilbo Baggins, the burglar, the chosen and the selected burglar. So now we should get on and make some plans. Very well, then, said Thorin. Supposingly, the burglar expertise gives him some ideas or suggestions. He turned with mock politeness to Bilbo. First, I would like you to know a little bit more about things, said he, feeling all confused and a bit shaky excited. So far, still tookishly determined to go on without things. I mean, about the gold and the dragon and, and all that, and how it got there, who it belongs to, and so on and so further. Bless me, said Thorne. Haven't you got a map, and didn't you hear our song? And haven't we been talking about this for four hours? All the same, I should like it clear and clean and plain and clear, said he, abstainfully, putting on his business manner, usually reserved for people who tried to borrow money off him, and doing his best to appear wise and prudent and professional live up to Gandalf's recommendation. Also, I'd like to know about the risks, out-of-pocket expenses, time required, a remission, and so forth, by which he meant, when am I going to get out of it, and am I going to come back alive? Oh, very well, said Thorin, long ago in my grandfather Thorin's time. Our family was driven out to the far north, and came back with their wealth and their tools to this mountain on the map. It has been discovered by my father, my ancestor, Thrain the old, but now they mined it, and they tunneled it, and they made hunger halls and great workshops, and in addition, I believe they found a good deal of gold, many jewels, too. Anyway, 
then grew immensely rich and famous, and my grandfather was king under the mountain again, and treated with great reverence by the mortal men who lived down south, and were gradually spreading up the running river as far as the valley overshadowed by the mountain. They built the merry town of Dale there in those days. The king used to send out our smiths and reward even the least skillful most richly. Fathers would beg us to take their sons as apprentices and pay us handsomely, especially in food supplies, which we never bothered to grow or find ourselves. Altogether, those were good days for us, and the poorest of us had money to spend and to lend and leisure to make beautiful things just for the fun of it, not to speak of the most marvelous and magical toys, the like of which not to be found in the world nowadays. So my grandfather's halls became full of armor and jewels and carvings and cup, and the toy market of Dale was the wonder of the North. Well, Bilbo... Undoubtedly, that was what brought the dragon. Dragons steal gold and jewels, you know, from men, elves, and dwarfs whenever they can find them. And they guard their plunder as long as they live, which is practically forever unless they're killed and never enjoy a brass ring of it. Indeed, they hardly know a good bit of work from a bad, although they usually have a good notion of current market value that they can't make a thing for themselves, not even mend a little loose scale of the armor. There were lots of dragons in the north these days, and gold was probably getting scarce up there with the dwarf flying south or getting killed, and all the general waste and instructions that dragons make going from bad to worse. There was this most specific, greedy, strong, and wicked worm called Smog. One day, he flew up in the air and came south, right? The first we heard of it was a noise like a hurricane coming from the north, and the pine trees on the mountains started creaking, cracking in the wind. Some of the dwarves who happily to be outside, I was luckily about a fine adventurous lad in those days, always wandering about, and it saved my life a day. Well, from a good way off, and we saw the dragon settled on our mountain in a spot of flame. Then he came down the slopes, and when he reached the woods, they all went up in fire. By that time, all the bells were ringing and tail, and the warriors were arming. The dwarves rushed out of their great gate, but there was a dragon waiting for them. None escaped that way. The river rushed up steam, and the fog fell on Dale, and in the fog, the dragon came upon them and destroyed most of the warriors. The usual unhappy story, it was only too common in those days. Then he went back and crept in through the front gate, and routed out all the halls, the lanes, alleys, cellars, mansions, passages. After that, there was no more dwarves left alive inside, and he took all their wealth for himself. Probably, for that is the dragon's way, he's piled it all up in a great heap far inside and sleeps on it for a bed. Later, he used to crawl out of the great gate and come by night to Dale, and carry away people, especially maidens, to eat until Dale was just ruined and all the people were dead or gone. Well, what goes on there now, I don't know for certain, but I don't suppose anyone lives near the mountain and far edge of the Long Lake nowadays. The few of us that were well outside sat and wept in hiding and cursed smog and there we were, unexpectedly joined by my father and my grandfather with singed beards. They looked very grim, but they said very little. When I asked how they got that one day in the proper time, I should know, and we went away. We have had to earn our livings as best we could, coming up and down the lands, often enough to sinking as low as a blacksmith work or even coal mining. But we have never forgotten our stolen treasure. By now, and not so badly off, here Thorley stroked the gold chain around his neck. We still mean to get it back and bring our curses home to Smog, if we can. I've often wondered about my father and my grandfather's escape. I see now they must have had a private side door, which they only knew about. But apparently we made a map, and I should like to know how Gandalf got a hold of it, and why it did not come down to me, the rightful heir. I did not get a hold of it, I was given it, said the wizard. 
Your grandfather Thorn was killed, you remember, in the mines of Moria by Azog the Goblin. Curse his name, yes, says Dorian. And Thrain, your father, went away on 21st of April, a hundred years ago, last Thursday. And never been seen by you since. True, true, said Thorin. Well, your father gave this to me to give to you. And if I have chosen my own time and way for handing it over, you could hardly blame me, considering the trouble I had to find you. Your father could not remember his own name, and when he gave me the paper, never told me yours. So on the whole, I think I ought to be praised and thanked. Here it is, said he, handing the map to Thorin. I don't understand, said Thorin. Bilbo felt he was like, likely to say the same. The explanation did not seem to explain. Your grandfather, said the Whitlid slowly and grimly, gave the map to his son for safety before he went to the mines of Moria. Your father went away to try to kill his luck with the map after your grandfather was killed, and lots of adventures, the most unpleasant sort he had, but never got near the mountain. How he got there, I don't know. But I found him a prisoner in the dungeons of the Necromancer. Whatever were you doing there? asked Thorin with a shudder. And all the dwarves shivered. Never you mind. I was finding things out, as usual. And a nasty, dangerous business it was. Even I, Gandalf, only just escaped. I tried to save your father, but it was too late. He was witless and wandering, and had forgotten almost anything except the map. And the key. We have long ago paid the goblins of Moria, said Thorn. We must give a thought to the necromancer. Don't be absurd. He is an enemy quite beyond the powers of all the dwarves put together. If they could all be collected again from the four corners of the world, the one thing your father wished for was his son to read the map and use the key. The dragon and the mountain are more than big enough tasks for you. Here, here, said Bilbo, and actually said it aloud. Hear what? they all said, turning suddenly towards him, and he was so flustered in the engine. Hear what I've got to say. Well, what's that? they asked. Well, I should say that you ought to go east and have a look around. After all, there is a side door, and dragons must sleep sometimes, I suppose. If you sit on the door and step long enough, I dare say you will think of something. And, well, don't you know it, I think we have all talked long enough for one night. If you see what I mean, what about going to bed as an early start and all that? I will give you a good breakfast before you go. Before we go. I suppose you mean, says Thorne. Aren't you the burglar? And isn't sitting on the doorstep your job, not to speak of getting inside the door? But agree about the bed and breakfast. I like eggs, six of them with my ham, when starting on a journey. Fried, not poached, and mind you, don't break them. After all the others has ordered their breakfast without so much as a please, which annoyed Bilbo very much, they all got up. The hobbit had to find room for them, all filled with his spare rooms and made beds on chairs and sofas. Before he got them all stowed and went to his own little bed, very tired and not altogether happy. One thing he did he did make his mind up about was not going to bother to get up very, very early and cook everybody else's wretched breakfast. The Tookish was wearing off, and he was not quite sure that he was going on a journey in the morning. As he lay in bed, he could hear Thorn humming to self in the bedroom next to him. Turned over misty mountains cold, to dungeons deep and caverns old. Me must awake a break of day, too far nor long forgotten gold. Bilbo went to sleep with that in his ears, and it gave him very comfortable dreams. It was long after the break of day, when he woke up. 
That was Unexpected Party, Chapter 1 of The Hobbit, from a book I have from 1973. I hope you like it. This is Chris Wicks, and if you'd like to hear more, please let me know. I'll keep reading more chapters. You could also read a different book if you like. Either way, thanks, and be good humans.